Hey, good morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning, homies. And I just realized while I was sitting there, we also welcome those who are watching at home, so you also are homies. All right, okay, so good to see you. For those of you I have not yet had the uh, privilege of meeting, I'm Kevin Tully, I'm pastor here, and you are watching an online worship experience at the First United Methodist Church of Waxahachie, Texas. We welcome you. Thank you so much, those of you who are watching at home. Thank you for checking in. Thank you for typing uh, your words of encouragement or letting us know any way that we might help you in the days that are ahead. This is a special weekend across our nation, Martin Luther King Day weekend, which reminds us of such important and Christian principles by which we all, I hope, seek to live. I want to draw your attention to one special opportunity that is coming up. Uh, beginning January 27th. January 27th is a Wednesday, and at 7 o'clock, uh, beginning then and continuing for 12 weeks, I'll be leading an online Bible study. Um, you can check it out on our Facebook page. I hope you'll sign up. Now, this isn't exactly like a Zoom call um, in the sense that I'll, you'll be able to see me and hear what I have to say. You'll be able to interact uh, through the keyboard, but I will not see you, or, and we will not hear one another's voices, which I think is a little easier. Uh, we don't have to worry about the mute button so much, that sort of thing. Who's it for? Well, um, it's for anyone, but I, I, as I've been uh, preparing this, I think it's for two audiences especially. First of all, those of us who struggle with the apparent... Uh, conflicts uh, between what we hear from science and the traditional language of the scriptures. For instance, uh, scientists tell us that, that however it was created, the universe was started about 13.8 billion years ago through a big bang. Um, if you buy into that or lean in that direction or have a tendency to trust uh, science, how do we make sense of, how do we then interpret the words of Scripture? Are they still valid? The other audience, and uh, I think this applies to a lot of us, are those who are somewhat um, familiar with the sweep of Scripture. That is to say, we know that there was a person named Abraham, and we've heard the name Moses. We've heard about King David, and there's a Saul in there, isn't there? And uh, 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 there's Peter and James and John. But... How do they line up? Where did they fit into? Which one came first? Um, it would be sort of like someone uh, looking at American history and knowing, well, there was a Robert E. Lee and there was a, uh, there was a John Hancock and there was a Martin Luther King. Which came first? So if you want to find your way around the Bible, if you want to become more familiar with the sweep and the narrative of Scripture, I really hope you'll check that out. It was interesting to me that the first two people to sign up um, for this course was, uh, were friends in New York City and Oregon. So a big difference, either coast, and I hope that you'll sign up as well. I think that's about all I have to share with you, except again to welcome you to this service of worship. In a few moments' time, we're going to install and uh, give thanks to God for every person who is a leader in the church. Sunday school teachers, nursery workers, committee members, and uh, we hope that it is a sincere, I know it is for me, a sincere time of thanksgiving. Uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. But let's begin our worship by singing praise to God. Our first hymn is Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Let's stand and sing with gusto. Oh, yeah. 
In just a moment, I'm going to ask that everyone who is a leader or helper in the church to stand. I'll let you know when that moment comes. Um, Val and I have positioned ourselves immediately behind the altar of the church. The altar since ancient times has always been considered a sacred place where sacred things happen. People come to the altar to begin their walk with Christ, to be baptized, to take vows of church membership. Vows of uh, marriage are said before God's altar. You are not able, because of the pandemic rules uh, under which we now live together, to come to the altar. But when those of you who stand uh, do so, I hope that in your heart and in your head you will imagine and in your spirit be standing before the altar of God. To those of you who are church leaders watching from home, may I ask you to do something that I don't think is silly, and that is when the time comes for you to stand, if you are able, would you do so? When I ask the questions that these folks will be responding to, would you give your response from home? I hope it will be a holy moment for you as well. Dear friends, you have been called by God and chosen by the people of God for leadership in the church. Ministry is a blessing and a serious responsibility. We, your church, as your church family, recognize your special gifts and have called you to work among us and for us. In love, we thank you for accepting and being willing to offer your best to the Lord, to his people, and to our ministry in the world. Live a life in Christ and make him known in your witness and work. Listen to what the scriptures say. God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God himself is behind it all. Each person is giving, given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful, wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between the spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. All these gifts have a common origin, but are handed out by one, one by one, by the one Spirit of God. He decides who gets what and when. You can easily enough see how this kind of thing works by looking no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. It's exactly the same with Christ. By means of his one spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. We each used to be independently call our own shots, but then we entered into a large and integrated life in which he has the final say in everything. This is what we proclaimed in word and action when we were baptized. Each of us is now a part of his resurrection body, refreshed and sustained at one fountain, his spirit, where we all come to drink. The old labels we once used to identify ourselves, labels like Jew or Greek, slave or free, are no longer useful. We need something larger, more comprehensive. And now to all of you who serve the church in various ways, teachers, leaders, nursery workers, sound, audio, video folks, security team, committee members, no matter who you are, would you please stand before this congregation and before the altar of God. 
Today, we install you as designated leaders with specific responsibilities in this church. I ask you, whether you are here in person or watching online, to confirm your ministry by answering the following questions. First, do you declare yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ? Your answer, I do. Will you devote yourself to the service of God in the, in the world? Your answer, I will. Will you help this church to be a people of love and peace? Will you be responsible to the task to which you have been chosen? Let's pray. Almighty God, pour out your blessing upon these your servants who have been given particular ministries in your church. Grant them what they need to give themselves wholeheartedly in your service. Keep before them the example of our Lord and help them learn and grow as they seek to be faithful to him through their service. Amen. Amen. And now to you, the members of this church. Let's give thanks for these people and for their willingness to serve. Let's do all we can to assist and encourage them in their ministries to which they have been called, giving them our cooperation, counsel, and prayers. If you're willing to accept them, confirm them, and help them in these ways, please respond by saying, we will. We will. Thank you. God bless you. Let's sing together. in worship, let us pray together. Holy God, it's been a strange and difficult transition from Christmas to Epiphany and now to this winter season. We were already struggling through the pandemic and now we've been shaken, shaken to our very core by the fragility of our democracy. And so we come, not just seeking answers, but seeking strength and courage for the days ahead. We pray for courage to be the people you have called us to be, people who seek justice and peace through your love for all people of all nations, all creeds, and all faiths. We struggle with questions that seem to have no answers and problems that have insurmountable solutions. We are a deeply divided nation in a deeply divided world. Surely, with all our flaws, we must test your patience. But we know that your love encompasses all. Your love is never ending. Your love is always forgiving. Our hope remains in your great love for us. You are our hope, and it is in this hope that we live and move and have our being. Empower us with the strength and wisdom to affirm all people and never to alienate them. Surely, we know that you love all people and consider each one important and part of your creation. Help us to be more like Jesus, whom you sent to show us how to love and respect others. Oh God, we ask you to help us Help us to be change agents in this world. On this Martin Luther King week, 
Give us courage to speak out about our faith, to teach those around us about your love for all, and to lead by the example to love and respect all people. All these things we ask in the name of the Prince of Peace, who taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, let's face it, friends. The offering time during this pandemic season has been weird. We're not doing anything. We're not passing the offering place. There's no ushers um, passing the plates and then taking money onto the church office. And yet, we've insisted on having these moments when we sit and think and nothing happens. We have some music playing. Why would we do that? First, to keep before you the reality of the need. Second, to give us all an opportunity to think about, maybe, in, maybe better than ever before, um, what it means to have received and then share with others. It's a chance for us to maybe pray about the use of the gifts that we give, whether we've mailed this in or are holding it back or waiting to the end of the year or see on our uh, bank statement that an electronic funds transfer happened. Whatever the case, it's a good time for us to simply stop and pause to thank God that we get to be a part of God's work in the world and that this is one way we do so. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, forgive us for every selfish time that we've held back or thought our needs mattered more than others, especially when we've had it to share. Help us to grow in our faithfulness to you and our spirit of generosity that we might also experience the joy of being used by you for what you want to do in us, through us, and among us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
preparation this morning is Jesus Paid It All. Let's remain standing as we sing together. standing as we share this morning's scripture, which comes to us from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 26, verses 69 through 75. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean, but he denied it before all of them saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said, Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. May God bless the reading, hearing, and receiving of these words. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. See his open arms, for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us, whoever We'll live forever. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise, praise God. God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, oh praise Him, for the wonders of His love, His amazing love, for God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in Him will live forever. Walking in freedom for God so loved, God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Thank you, Rich, Andy, Mary, Donnie, Tim Stewart. Great job. Thank you very much. What is it you carry around with you everywhere? It's interesting what some people um, have decided they need to have with them at all times. In an earlier age, and I was one of these for years as well, men would often carry a little pocket knife with them. I did that up until the time that the second one was confiscated at the airport. And then I realized I can't do that anymore. Most women that I know carry a purse with them just about everywhere. And all of us, almost all of us, regardless of age, are in the habit of not going out that door unless we have our smartphone with us. I know folks that won't go anywhere, including to the bathroom, without their smartphone, you know, just in case. I'm fascinated by thinking about what it is we carry with us in our hearts and in our heads. Not just the tangible stuff that I can lay down and lose. I'm more fascinated by this idea of what it is you and I carry up here and in here. Um, some time ago, I introduced to you what I think is at least an acceptable definition for the word spiritual. Think about it. That's sort of a vague concept. But what I said to you was spiritual things are things that are intangible. That is to say... You can't touch them. You can't see them under a microscope. You can't uh, smell them or see them or feel them. And yet, they are real. Thus, we would say things like love and hate and thoughts and feelings and emotions are all spiritual things. And I think that works. I think that's a, a workable definition of spiritual. And what I want to talk with us about this morning, at least at the, this part of the sermon, is to say that those things that, to which I'm referring, what it is we carry around in our hearts and in our heads, 
are spiritual things, whether we are religious or not. Now, since this is a Christian sermon in a Christian church, and since in just a few moments I'm going to begin to talk about things like God and Jesus and the Christian faith, when it comes to people carrying stuff around with them, I would rather hang out with someone who carries a couple of key ideas from Scripture and allows those ideas to guide them in their living than I would want to hang around with someone who carries an entire Bible around with them and uses that Bible as a weapon to justify themselves or judge others. And by the way, I have literally known people who did that with the Scriptures. Jesus was able to summarize the entire Bible of his day, what we would call the Hebrew Scriptures, what he in his day called, was called the Law and the Prophets, with just two ideas. He said, I can sum all of this up for you. Love God with everything you've got, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if a person has that in their head and in their heart, and they live according to that, I submit to you, they have got something powerful. Something powerful and important. But all of us also carry other things as well, do we not? We carry shame that was poured upon us by others. We carry resentments from pe for people who have hurt us in some way or another. I have found that so many people have, whether they show it or not, deep insecurities which influence the way that they live. And we all carry around memories of our failures and sometimes feelings of failures. And that's what I want to focus on for the rest of the time I have left to preach to you this morning in this third sermon designed to help us stay on track in terms of doing God's will and heading in the direction we feel God calling us to go in this new year. Now, the reason I think that this I, that I'm so... Um, I believe it's so important to talk about staying on track is because I think just about everybody hears from God. I think just about everybody hears from God. Even the atheist, the agnostic, when they experience the wonders of creation, they at least, I think, in their minds, hearts, soul, spirit, in their curiosity, think something like, Wow, this is beautiful. Um, but it's what you do with that experience from hearing from God that matters. I think people hear from God when they hear something or see something that touches them, touches their emotions. Something that is good and beautiful, which calls them to respond to what I would say was God's Spirit speaking to them. Sometimes it happens when a person is praying. And sometimes it happens when a person has messed up. In those awful moments following a terrible argument with a loved one, a spouse, a parent, a child, that grief, that regret those tears. I think that's God talking. I think it happens when a person is served court documents and they find themselves in trouble with the law or even when a person finds themselves in jail 
and they realize my life is not going in a very good direction. I think that's God speaking. So they make this decision to change, but something happens. That's what I'm calling getting off track. How does that happen? Well, I'll tell you, somebody bails you out. And all of a sudden, the crisis isn't as great. Uh, the spouse who we were afraid was going to leave for a long time comes back. They may not be speaking to us yet, but they've come back. And so we sort of uh, set, set to the side all of those thoughts and ideas and feelings about straightening up our lives. We get overwhelmed. We experience a lack of resources. I, I, I said I was going to head in this direction, but what, what do I do now? Is there a club out there? Is there a group? There's probably some stuff online, but then we don't do anything about it. See, that's getting off track. We try and we fail. We meant to, but didn't. We started, but didn't hang with it. One of Jesus' most famous parables, one that I love and which I think is deep is, uh, and, and so true to, to human experience, is his parable of the sower. That's spelled S-O-W-E-R. About a man who is planting grain. And, and we are told about some grain that started growing. And it grew up, and some of it grew up fairly quick, which is a beautiful thing. I mean, that's what you want to happen, right? But it died out. Got choked, in one case, it got choked off by weeds. In another, it just didn't have any support. So some people get a good start and then they get off track and failure is one of the things that can cause that to happen. That's what I want to talk with you about this morning. Failure is, an, is a special kind of experience. It can be particularly difficult, almost like a roadblock. We were headed in a good direction. There's a brick wall here. Um, you know, I was, I was prepared for a few bumps in a road. I've got a mountain in front of me. Or in other people's lives and experiences, it's like a deep valley that we can't get out of. A deep swimming pool. That's, uh, let's say that it's empty of water and there's no steps and there's no stairs and there's no handrails. We're down there. How do I climb out? Sometimes failure discourages us in such a way that it makes us want to give up trying. Sometimes it affects our ideas about ourselves and God and life in a way that lasts a long time. Get told you're a failure enough and you might just begin to believe it. But, and this is a big but somebody's going to get a clip of that part of the sermon and do something wrong with it. This is a big but, all right? At other times, failure can actually become a positive thing that either reroutes the direction of our lives or teaches us things that can be very valuable in the future. In the days ahead, the weeks ahead, the years, the decades, maybe for the rest of our lives. The biblical example for our consideration this morning, who appeared in the scripture passage that Lee Alvenshine read for us a moment ago, is Jesus' disciple Peter, Simon Peter. Today we heard that part of his story when he failed. Failed himself, failed his promises, failed his intentions, failed his Lord. He found himself denying he knew, even knew Jesus, not just once, but three times. Now that's failure. Interestingly enough, however, that wasn't the end of his story. And generally speaking, that's not the way we think of Peter. Today, we would remember Peter as the leader of the early church in Jerusalem. 
our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters would say he was the first Papa. He was the first Pope. Papa meaning father or daddy uh, in Italian. The word Pope didn't come into use in English until the 10th century, but they would say he was the first Pope. He failed but was able to rise above his failure. How did that happen? He actually, if you read the history, find out that he became stronger after this failure. He cowered in fear, fear, but he eventually was martyred for his faith. He died for his faith in Jesus. And friends, this is a helpful example because you and I are going to fail. Now, the question is, will it beat us down? Will it defeat us? Or will it somehow have an effect in our lives such that it might eventually become a blessing? That's the question. This morning I want to share, I think it's four ideas with you from Scripture. The first is this. Some failures are good and need to happen. I don't think God controls everything the way some of my friends do. I gave up praying about football games years ago, all right? It's been decades since I prayed for a parking place, you know? I don't think God gets involved in everything the way that some people do. But I do think that there are times when something doesn't work out the way we wish it would, and in retrospect, we say, thank you, God. As Oklahoman, yes, Oklahoman, Garth Brooks sings, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. And I think that's true. In my opinion, and I'm not speaking on behalf of this church or this staff or United Methodists everywhere, but in my opinion, the assault on our Capitol building 11 days ago was something that needed to fail. Those who stormed the Capitol building may lament the fact that they weren't able to accomplish what they wanted. I view that failure as a good thing. So, one of the first things we do when failure comes is to ask, was this a good thing I was pursuing or was it a not? Was it not a good thing? By what sense of values am I measuring success and failure? Imagine with me, if you will, two people. And I'm just going to make up the story. Um, and so I get to uh, create them in our, heart, in, in our heads. Um, two people, both of whom are Christian, or say they are, or think they are. Um, and one of them makes a million dollars a year. And the other one makes hardly anything, just enough to pay the rent and, and eat, pay Social Security. And that's about it. Now, if you and I are measuring success in terms of money, then one of these people is a success and one of them is a failure, or at least not doing very well. But... This is my story, so I get to add a little bit to it, all right? Now, I want you to realize that the one who's making a million dollars a year is involved in some illicit and illegal activity. Pornography, um, sex trade. Um, here's one. Since I've already crossed the line in terms of commenting on social ills, here's one that kind of flies beneath the radar, but um, I think church people ought to think about this. I think that the payday lending industry is immoral. It's legal, but it's immoral. Some payday lenders charge up to 400% annual percentage rate to those who can afford that sort of thing the least. They prey on those who are most vulnerable to their practices and who are least financially savvy. So let's say one person that makes a million dollars does something that's just kind of not very ethical. But this other person that I was imagining, let's say that she has had her heart captured by a, a nonprofit. 
that she is involved in, one that really helps people, lifts people up. And she's decided she's only going to accept from this group as much money as she needs to stay alive. Now, given that information, which one would you say is a success and which one would you say is a failure? It depends on what your goals are, what your values are. And God and Jesus and the scriptures invite us to be guided by a certain set of values and standards. The next idea is that failure is an opportunity to learn and improve. Let us never forget that. In the case of Jesus' disciple Peter, if you were to read this text, and I encourage you to, if you were look, to look in your Bible or even on your smartphone at your Bible app, if you were just to scroll up a few verses, what you would find is that this same Simon Peter, just a few verses earlier, swore and promised, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. But he did. It's fun to read this, the Bible over time. We don't just, what I've discovered is that we don't just uh, learn the facts and figures, but we get a more nuanced understanding of the beauty and the depth. For instance, you read the Gospels enough and you not only know what Peter said, okay, and just have those facts, but you actually catch a glimpse of Peter's personality and what he was doing when he promised Jesus, I will never desert you, was a reflection of his personality. He was bold. He was brash. He was outspoken. But he did fail. After the resurrection, after the resurrection, after the day of Pentecost, when the early church was born, Peter appears again. Only he's a little bit different. How so? Well, let me tell you about a little bit of early church history that I don't preach to you enough and other people don't preach to, to you enough and we ought to take notice of you. It was earth-shaking. And yet some of us who have studied the Bible um, really aren't even aware of maybe the event itself or, and certainly not of how important it was. It was when Peter and the Apostle Paul butted heads and called each other out and argued and confronted each other to each other's face and, and were at odds with one another. Why? Because Peter was convinced that only Jews could become disciples of Jesus. That this salvation that Jesus, the Jew, had brought was for the people of God, and the people of God were the Jews, the Hebrews. Paul comes in, kind of late arrival to this group, um, in fact, one that used to persecute to the church, and he shows up in Jerusalem, and he says, I hear what you're saying, Peter, but I'm telling you, I preached to them, and they, they received the Holy Spirit. It happened. I think they can be I think they can be followers of Jesus too. I think that this salvation was for them as well. Huge moment. And the reason that you and I are sitting here this morning or watching online or consider yourself Christian, um, unless you're a convert from Judaism, is, beca is because Peter eventually agreed with Paul. Peter, the one that was so sold on himself, the one who just knew that his opinion was right, something had happened to him so that even though it took a while and took some difficulty, he eventually backed down. Maybe it was this experience of having seen, you know, I'm not always right, that did this for him, for the church, and for you and me. Human beings have a tendency to blame others when things go wrong. In terms of our failures, we do that. Um, it's there from the beginning pages of the Bible. Adam and Eve are caught eating the forbidden fruit, 
And Adam, uh, when God says, what are you guys up to? What are you guys doing? Adam says, what me? She gave it to me, all right? And then if you'll read the story carefully, what he says is, and come to think of it, you're the one who gave her to me. So he's sort of blaming God as well, all right? And that's a part of who we are. That's one way that people deal with failure. A better way is to learn from it and to acknowledge the truth. We blame other people. We blame circumstances. We blame mean teachers. We blame high taxes. We blame bad bosses. We blame the other political party. But in many cases, the failure happened because of something we did or didn't do. You know what? Truth of the matter is, I didn't study very hard. I didn't research enough. I didn't wait. I didn't seek help. I didn't get other people's opinions. If we can see the truth of our failures, they have an ability to teach us. So that even when failure comes, we don't give up. Because as Paul said, um, in this process of sufferings producing endurance and eventually character, we don't give up because the love of God has been poured into our hearts. What does that mean? It finally got, gets through to us. God's not punishing me. God's trying to teach me. You know, I can't blame this on God. This is an opportunity by which I might see something to help me be more faithful, more responsible. While we're on this, and, uh, and don't worry, I'm, I am getting closer to the end of the sermon, okay? Um, let's acknowledge that in this matter of learning from failures, you don't have to learn from your own failures all the time. You can learn from others as well. Here's one that's important to me. It has hurt my heart through the years, and may God, for, may God help me from ever thinking I'm above sinning, or may, may God protect me from arrogance of heart. But in my years in ministry, I've been so pained as I've seen some colleagues uh, sit, uh, submit to what we would call a moral failure, general, generally of a sexual nature, and how it destroys not only their Christian witness, but the reputation of Christianity and how it disappoints their friends and how it uh, decimates, splits congregations. And so that's one I cut out a lot of articles about and keep on file and remind myself about. But there's a story in the Old Testament about that. King David, at the pinnacle of his, of his success, perhaps because of his success, decides to take another man's wife. It's a powerful story. And yet, so many of my colleagues, um, whether I knew them or not, so many folks we read about on an almost weekly basis in the newspapers. Experience moral failure of that kind because they wouldn't learn from the story of King David. You can learn from others' mistakes as well. I've heard it said, smart people learn from their mistakes. Really smart people learn from others' mistakes. The last idea is this. Hey, as long as you're alive, Failure is never final. And that's because of who God is. You mess up a hundred times, guess what? God's ready to go for 101. Jesus reflected this in, uh, again, Peter's question of him. I've got the, how many times do we have to forgive somebody? Seven times? Jesus said, try 70 times seven. In other words, it's a way of life. You just, you, have, you just got to keep working with people. And God keeps working with us. I want to close with um, an observation and a good story that I think is fitting for this Martin Luther King, King Day weekend. During this difficult and turbulent time in our nation's history, one of the things that I do not want us to do, and I'm asking you, please do not do. And if you're tempted to do it, 
Come talk to me about it. And those of you online, I'm hoping you won't do it either, is to lump all people together and to judge all the people in various groups as being the same as one another. That's a failure. And I think that's a sin and it's not helpful. This is a problem for our nation and I think we need, I think we do well to notice we have failed at that. And some of us as individuals being honest enough to say, I have failed at that. When Republicans use words like libs and socialist to describe anyone who is a Democrat, that is not only not helpful, it is ignorant. It is ignorant in the sense that it ignores the varied shades of political, uh, political belief within the Democratic Party. When Democrats label all Republicans as Trumpsters or racists or anti-Semites, the same thing is true. It is ignorant in terms of ignoring the various shades of perspective within that party. Now, that having been said, we must notice that many of those who stormed the Capitol building 11 days ago carried symbols of hate and racism and anti-Semitism. I would hope that Christians who have been drawn into or drawn close to such actions and attitudes would ask themselves, is this Christian behavior? And as I said earlier, someone who succeeds at an in immoral enterprise is, in reality, a failure. Let me close with the story. I'd like to remind you of the story of George Wallace. Now, I think it's very fitting on this Martin Luther King Day weekend to remind us about George Wallace, the four-term governor of Alabama. He died in 1998. I believe he was 101 years old when he finally died. Uh, survived an assassination attempt. Some of our younger church members will not really know who George Wallace was. I can sum it up this way. What Dr. Martin Luther King was to those who were in favor of the civil rights movement, George Wallace was to those who were against it. Racists, segregationists, and the Ku Klux Klan saw him as a kind of hero. What not as many people know is that before he died, George Wallace had changed. He openly admitted that he had been wrong when he stood at the door of the University of Alabama and denied entrance to black students. He even apologized for that action the last few years of his life. And in so doing, he became something of a hero to those who value things like repentance. Because of the way that he changed in his intolerant views, which, okay, is the final lesson and how it is we might turn failure into success. Um, what is it we need to do? Well, when Jesus spoke about it, he used that biblical word, repentance. When my alcoholic and drug addict friends who are in recovery talk about it, what they say is this, you finally hit bottom whenever you decide to stop digging. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Tolley. Our closing hymn, our hymn of invitation this morning is Stand By Me. I invite you to stand with me as we sing together. Storms 
of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. this place, what is our mission? To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And how will we do that? By growing in the knowledge, service, and love of God as we share Christ, disciple believers, and serve others. Let God deal with your failures. You might even get them out from under the rug if you sort of swept them that direction because God is able to take them, use them, transform them, and us into the means through which God heals us and the world. So go in peace. Amen. Amen.